Welcome to the Shades of Havana podcast, where we explore the rich history and culture of one of the world's most iconic cigar-making cities. Ybor City has been synonymous with premium cigars for over a century, thanks to the pioneering efforts of visionaries like Vincente Martinez, Ybor and Julius Caesar, J.C. Newman, and the countless families and businesses that followed in their footsteps. From the bustling cigar factories that once lined Ybor City streets, to the boutique shops and lounges that dot the city today, Tampa's cigar industry has left an indelible mark on the city's identity and character. Join us as we sit down with the industry experts, passionate enthusiasts, and local legends to uncover the stories, traditions, and innovations that have made Tampa Bay the cigar capital of the world. Whether you're a seasoned enthusiast or a curious newcomer, we invite you to light up, relax, and journey with us into the fascinating cigar capital of the world. What are you smoking? Welcome to Shades of Havana with your host, David Zimmel. Welcome to Shades of Havana. I'm your host, David Zimmel. We're here in Tampa at the J.C. Newman Cigar Factory celebrating the 128th anniversary. I'd like to welcome our sponsors. Celebrating their 75th anniversary, Porsche Tampa, the global leader in two-way cigar humidity control, Bovita Inc., award-winning air purifiers, Rabbit Air. Turn your garage or basement into the ultimate man cave with Man Cave King. When you're looking to purchase or refinance your home, fund your bliss at Bliss Mortgage. For the latest styles in golf and beach apparel, Fluke Apparel Company, and treasure awaits, visit Tampa Bay. I am smoking a um, Julian Caesar, which is which I'm taking a box home with me, this, which I will pay for. Uh, but this is really a great cigar. Really enjoy it. Um, I'd like you guys to introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and let me know what you're smoking. My name is Eric Newman. Welcome to our family up here at the Jason Newman Cigar Factory. I'm smoking a Questre Centrofino Sung Sun Grown. Uh, the wrapper is what makes it special. It comes, it's grown in a special section of Ecuador by this gentleman on my left. It's uh, Centrofino, comes from the middle of the plant. We think it's the most flavorful part of the, of the Ecuador tobacco. But I will turn this over to my compatriot over here. John Oliva. I'm, I'm uh, John Oliva Jr. from Oliva Tobacco Company. I'm here in Tampa. Uh, we've been here since uh, 1934. And uh, we uh, grow cigar tobacco for the Newmans and Fuentes among, among many. Awesome. Uh, my name is Sean Knutson. I'm with Bovida. We manufacture a patented product that controls humidity inside packaging and containers. And uh, our company is based in Minnesota. And I am very happy that I made the move two years ago to live here in the wonderful city of uh, Tampa, Florida. And uh, it's an honor to be on the program, David. Uh, welcome. I, I appreciate uh, you guys being here. So, uh, Eric, why don't we start off? I was just curious, would, do you guys work on new ideas for new cigars on a continual basis? Or are you satisfied with what you have? You know, in other words, what goes into figuring out if you're going to try a different type of cigar, you know, uh, tobacco, what have you. For us and probably other cigar manufacturers, it takes a long lead, lead time. We're working on new cigars for 2024, 2025, because not only do we experiment with different tobaccos, but after we make them, well, they need to age for six to nine months. So we'd see how are we do. Of course, we cheat. We don't wait till nine months. How, they, how is it? Do you have a baby by then? But we, we open them up and test them along the uh, way. We're always testing new t t t t t t t tobaccos. Go to our friends like John Oliva here. I mean, recently we've been experimenting with the Corojo wrapper that he grows for us and others. And it's uh, been a successful venture. But it's not like we're gonna, we have a trade show in, in a couple months. 
You can't say, okay, let's get this tobacco. You can't go to the grocery store and get, it's like, I can't get tobacco, I go to the grocery store. We have to give them at least two to three years ahead of time notice if we want to take any quantities of all the special tobacco, which has been a learning experience. And uh, so we always got things in the process. I would probably say that maybe majority of what we test, we try, doesn't come to market, but enough does to make it exciting. And you try, obviously, different sizes, shapes. That's that's part of the process, or is it, it really more the tobacco itself? Probably more the, the, the tobacco. We, when we test cigars, we make samples. It's usually, usually a Toro shape cigar. It's the most common shape that's uh, most widely recognized and most widely smoked. So we just try different blends with a Toro shape cigar. And the other th question I had for you is, do you ever take anything out of stock? In other words, is there ever a time where there's a cigar that just might not sell well enough that you say to yourself, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're not gonna use that cigar anymore, or that, that doesn't happen? Our accountants talk to us, work for us. <laughs> we're guilty, like every other cigar manufacturer is. We love to introduce new products. We very rarely like to take something off the uh, market. Believe it or not, we sell the brick and mortar smoke shops and their space for cigars are finite. I mean, they, they, they can't use a shoehorn to get more boxes in. Finally, they said, you want to add some more cigars, you take some out. So um, manufacturers are quick to add something new. Everybody wants what's new, which is both a blessing and a curse, but we're slow to take things off the market, but we, we do it occasionally. Not because we want to, because we're, it's a smart thing to uh, do. How far did the three of you go back? Uh, when did you guys meet each other? How, how far, how far did, uh, when did this start? My father used to work with John Ito's grandfather um, uh, back in, in the late 50s. How far it goes back? My mother told me a story. Johnny's, John Levis Jr.'s grandfather called my grandfather in 1947. We're still in Cleveland. Said, Miss New, I want to sell you tobacco. My grandfather, being from the old country, says, okay, we have Sunday dinner. You, have, you want to sell me tobacco? You have to come to our family. We'll talk about it. It's a Sunday dinner. My mother told me this story because she was pregnant with me, which goes back a long time ago. That's how far it goes, goes back. And I just turned wow. 75. That's awesome. That, that's great. And Sean, we've been working together for 25, 25 years. Um, Sean will talk more about his product than, than me. But for, forever, nobody likes to dry c c c c cigar. You want to have has some moisture into it, not too much moisture, but, but not it flaking off either. And being able to control the humidity of a cigar is vital to the enjoyment of the con consumer. Right. We're cigar manufacturing, that's what we do. John grows tobacco, that's what he does. But be able to control the community, the humidity at the time the consumer is able to select and enjoy his, his product is beyond our my pay scale, beyond Denny's. Right, that's the end, that's the end game, but that's the most most you know, one. Well, I say most everything's important. important. Everything's important. And I want to still still uh, Sean's so thunder. So, John, to, in, we'll go in order. Why don't you give us a little background about the family and how you guys got involved with the tobacco growing and where 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 does this take place? Um, uh, well, like like all Cubans that are in the cigar business, my great grandfather was a uh, was a was a was a tobacco farmer and land manager. Uh, for the Santa Damiana farm in Cuba. And uh, my grandfather was one of 11 uh, brothers and sisters that uh, uh, had to leave home at eight, only had a, a third grade education. Um, and you know, like, like a lot of immigrants wanted to come to the United States and, and, uh, and make us work. So he came when he was 18 into Ybor City in 1925. And, uh, and you know, started working as a tobacco broker or working as an assistant with a tobacco broker. And in 1934, started to leave a tobacco company. And, and since then, we've grown tobacco in four different countries. Uh, we're currently in uh, Nicaragua and Ecuador. And, uh, and, and, and I'm fourth generation tobacco, tobacco guy. So you so you're in uh, those two countries and what, what, where else? Where we were in the in the we were in the Dominican Republic, uh, and we were in Honduras also, and we were also in Costa Rica at one point. The uh, the operation actually the farming operation that we had in the Dominican was what be, ultimately became a small part. Ultimately became Chateau Fuente, and it looked nothing like it <laughs> does now when we had it compared to what uh, what Carlitos managed to do with it. But the soil was the same. 
the soil was the same, but but but. He, he took it to the next level. Chateau Flito <laughs> took it to a different level. So, so if the soil is the same, why, why is there a difference? Because if you know the story of, of Opus X, you know that at that time it was believed that you could not grow wrappers in the Dominican Republic. And us as purely tobacco growers, and we went there to try to grow wrapper in the Dominican, um, couldn't just market wrapper out of there. There wasn't a real wrapper culture at that in the Dominican at that time. And and to his great credit, Carlos Fuente Jr. changed that in the Dominican Republic. He took that form and he was determined to grow wrapper in the Dominican and and, Did and, and he job. created Opus X. Wow. Okay. So and, and that's you know one of the uh I guess against a lot of I guess a lot of people that told him he couldn't do it. Okay. And what do you was there? What do you think the the, the magic was? What perseverance, you, right? Okay, which is perseverance, crit, which is critical. Okay, and they don't they, the Newmans and the Fuentes don't release anything unless it's absolutely one hundred percent right. Now the the um, the, it, it, the the temperature and the, and the humidity, all those things come into play in growing in tobacco. Is there any time of year? in those countries that are better to grow than others, or is it an all year round thing? No, it's, there's better times than others. In Ecuador, for example, the growing season is more traditional starts. We do the start the seed beds in May and go through till, till the end of, or the beginning of December. And in Nicaragua, it's just the opposite. So, uh, and, and primarily your, your environment does matter, but in my opinion, the most important thing is, is soil. Soil is really what gives tobacco its different characteristics. And what about the amount of tobacco that you're growing today as opposed to 10, 15 years ago or 30 years ago? Is it more the same? No, we're growing more. Yeah, we're growing more. We're, we're up to four farms in Ecuador. I believe we have between 17 and 1,800 people working for us in Ecuador. Wow. And then our operation in Nicaragua, I've got another 1,200 over there because we're growing fillers and wrappers in Nicaragua now too. And we do all our processing, all our fermentation, everything takes place in Nicaragua. So everything we grow in Ecuador goes down in Nicaragua for processing. Wow, that's great. And Sean, how long have you been uh, CEO? How did you get involved with uh, Bavina? Yeah. Well, I'm one of uh, six original founders. Uh, we started in 1997. Our first office was uh, my kitchen in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was in my 20s. Um, started the company with a college friend of mine and with uh, two individuals uh, who happened to just retire from General Mills. One was a senior chemist for General Mills, highly accomplished, multi-award winning patent holder. The other one was a senior, senior in engineer. And they had this technology, uh, but they needed to make a business out of it. And that's where one of the other partners at the time was making wooden humidors. It was during the cigar boom. And we liked cigars. and. We're entrepreneurial and, and so on. And so these, this chemist and these two individuals from General Mills developed this technology for him to control humidity in his humidor because it was almost impossible. And um, so that's kind of the short version. We met, uh, I like this, call it a, none of us knew each other, okay, except for Tim and I, uh, Tim Swale and I knew each other from college. But the other ones we didn't know, it was just really luck that we all met and, and formed a company at that time. First time I met uh, Eric was probably 2000, maybe 1999, uh, right in that point. And humidity does play a really key role, but one thing that we recognize and accept, we're a supporting cast to the industry. And the stars of the show are the cigars, the manufacturers like J.C. Newman, like Fuente, like Oliva, who uh, pours their passion into their craft and trade. And our role, is really to showcase and make sure that that product is delivered to the customer, showcasing all of that nuance in that the tobacco has to offer. And I met uh, John, at, I think the first time was at Chateau de la Fuente when we were with Carlito, probably in the year 2000 or, or 2001 or something in that time frame when we went out to see the farms and really the transition of a lot of things that Carlito was doing. Um, and remember that story and uh, so on. So we kind of go back away and keep, keep in mind, you know, being in your 20s and being a, just a cigar consumer and a fan, you know, imagine meeting the Newmans and Carlos Fuente and John Oliva and, and all of this was like, wow, it's like meeting um, Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was really in awe 
And here we were trying to uh, convince them that this technology can really impact uh, this industry in a positive way and it's really needed. There's a void there. And so- It sounds like it's a perfect product for Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah, my you guys uncle, would have killed yeah, it. Yeah, my uncle always told me, why didn't you go on Shark Tank? Well, we didn't, we didn't have any interest That's in very going good. on TV. Uh, we're gonna take a short break and we're gonna hear a word from our sponsors. Shades of Havana and Cigar Journal, thank you for celebrating and watching our historical J.C. Newman 128th year anniversary series. As a sign of appreciation, we'll give you a one-year free subscription to the digital magazine. Access the best information on the global cigar world at Cigar Journal. Scan the QR code and apply the coupon code SOH23TAMPA prior to checkout. What's up, everybody? Chris Payne here, CEO and founder of the Fluke Apparel Company. In honor of this historical event, the Fluke Apparel Company will be offering a nice little discount for all you Shades of Havana, you cigar enthusiasts, conversational enthusiasts. Um, all you need to do is go to flukeapparelco.com and at checkout enter the letters SOH and you will receive a 15% off discount of your entire purchase. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we are a beach and golf apparel company formed right here at the Jersey Shore and we are excited for you guys to be a part of our family too. Visit Tampa Bay. So, Sean, getting back, you know, with, with the product, to me, as a consumer, it was when I first started smoking cigars, it was really difficult keeping the cigars in the proper humidity. I mean, I used to put them in the humidor, uh, and you know, they it was terrible. It, it, it's it's an unbelievable idea. Um, I used the product obviously, like in a plastic bag, if you're going to travel, but you can also use it in the humidor. Yeah, you can, you can use it in anything that can at least somewhat hold humidity. And so Bovida is, you know, if you're just a humidifier, that's not good, right? Because too much humidity is, is not good for the cigar. Too little is not good. So we pioneered the technology that we call two-way humidity control. So we're just as much as a dehumidifier as we are as a humidifier. As a matter of fact, when we first sat down with Carlos Fuente Jr., it was 1998, I believe 98 or 99, at the... Um, uh, at the time of the RTDA show in Las Vegas, and we told him about the technology, and he looked at us and he said, you know, if all you do is add humid er, humidity, I want nothing to do with this product. Yeah. But if you do what you say you do, by adding and removing the moisture to get that predetermined, you're gonna revolutionize this industry. That was his quote at that time in La at the trade show in Las Vegas. We were lucky to even get his time to pull him aside to a table to even share that with him. And that's where the relationship started and where a couple of years of testing and evaluation and so forth went to the point where then J.C. Newman um, graciously had us down here at their offices, offices in this building. And I remember the day with your father and so forth and evaluating this, looking at distributing a specific product. And as well as we were talking about putting our technology in the boxes of Arturo Fuente at the time. And, if any manufacturer at that time didn't need to control humidity, it would be them because everything was on an auto ship, sold instantly and so forth. But yet he, you know, they were the visionaries and Carlito was a visionary at that time to say that uh, this impacts positively, so we'll, we will do it. If there, you know, the guy who didn't need to do it embraced that vision for this aspect of the product uh, to make sure that moisture within the tobacco itself and in the blend was absolutely right because he recognized that it showcased the nuance of flavor the way he wanted it to. How did you market it globally? 
Well, it takes a long time, all right? You don't start globally, you start really small. And we recognize that our technology applies to many different industries. So any product that's you know, sensitive to those moisture changes, we have a product that can dial into the right level of humidity. But we started with the cigar market, the need was explicit. It's an industry where everybody understands that um, you need a humidor and so forth. So we at least had an open door of a need that everybody knew. And you know, being a cigar consumer, even new at that time in my 20s, knowing the difficulty of maintaining a humidor, it was just a nightmare. You had to guess when to refill your device with water. You didn't know when to, and when you did, the, you'd maybe put too much in the, the, uh, the expansion of the wrapper leaf so you could get cracks in that wrapper, et cetera. You can get mold introduction into the humidor because the humidity is going too high. It was a nightmare. So when, when this invitation to, to say, let's start a company together that can control humidity and remove all those headaches, so all the benefits that we have, is, is one thing, but we also remove all the anxiety and work that's involved with maintaining that cigar. Put the correct number of boveda in, close the lid, or seal the bag, or close the container, whatever you're using, and then you can forget about it and know that those cigars are cared for. Uh, you guys really don't have, there's no competition, am I right? Or? Well, uh, since the beginning, I would say in the early 2000s, there have been brands that have come out um, trying, you know, Lever, you know, trying to ride the coattails. Uh, at the time, we were Humidipac, by the way. So our brand was Humidipac early on. We changed to Boveda um, for a number of reasons. Um, but brands would always come out and try to compete and call to a, call themselves to a humidity control, even even if they weren't. They would. We used to have a water drop logo, and they would take a, a water drop and put arrows in it, like our arrows. And it was really hard to defend. Uh, that trademark because of the genericness of it. And same with Humidipac, the name. So Humidity Pouch and Humi Stick and Humidity Puck and all of these names would come out. And that's why we came out with the Boveda name because it was discreet, could stand on its own, not easily copied. And so now we didn't uh, have that confusion in the marketplace. But yes, technology still come, but we're patent protected uh, uh, with our formula. So when people come up with something that looks like Boveda, it really doesn't behave the same way that Boveda does. And so competitors that have come have, have always gone as well. Is everybody that started the business still in it? Uh, well, one, they, the uh, senior chemist that I mentioned, Dr. Albert, sorry, wonderful human being, passed away a few years ago. Um, um, the engineer, uh, Bob Essie, is, is retired. Um, uh, one of the individuals we had uh, bought out. So really, uh, we have three of us really three of us on the board of directors, and then two of us are involved in the operational part of the business. Myself, and then Tim Swale is the other one uh, involved in the in the business. Right. John, like um, uh, Eric has Drew coming in. Do you have any children or that? No, I'm it. <laughs> You're it. I'm it. I've got two daughters now. My nep my 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 cousin's got his son, um, who's uh, uh, he's a senior in high school right now. So that may be the... That what happens if he decides not to go into the business? Yeah. Eric's lucky he has Drew. Well, they asked John Sr., Leva, the same question a few years ago. Do you have a next generation? You're talking to him. Right. So he's not going anywhere. He's, he's, no, I'm he's here. a kid. <laughs> I used to referee his, his games playing high school football. Really? Yeah, we go back a long way. You're a referee, too. Yeah. Nice. I wouldn't even go... We wouldn't talk about that. Was the, he a good referee? He was a great referee. <laughs> He never threw me out of a game that I didn't get deserve, deserve to get thrown out of. I like, I like that caveat there. <laughs> no, because that's important. The succession plan is, is critical. Yeah. No, we, uh, yeah, like I said, um, I've got two daughters. Um, uh, they're doing their own thing right now. One's a senior in college still. Um, but, you know, our, if there was more marketing involved and more, my, my, what we do is going to these countries and growing tobacco and everything else like that. And, and, you know, listen, if my daughter had been, my daughters are interested in it, it's, it's open to them, but you know, they've taken their own, their own path. And, and so the Newmans have an unbelievable legacy. What do you guys, uh, how do you want to, you know, what's your legacy, uh, as the Newmans have, what's the future look like? I mean, you touched on, um, you know, with your daughter, but, what do you see in, in the future? My business exists through the manufacturer. Uh, people still confuse me with the Oliva cigar people, and we're different. We're, totally we're different. Totally different. We've been, at, at we've been doing what we've did been they doing at least buy a long time. Did oh, they, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah they did. Um, uh, uh, again, my, my, 
my business lives through the manufacturers. I mean, people, you know, people know us because of the manufacturers. Um, you know, when you smoke the cigar you're smoking, we grew that wrapper. We grew that wrapper. That's, that's, that's my satisfaction. Do you have a lot of competition? Is there competition? There's other, yeah, there's, well, there's other people, yeah, that grow, that grow to, that grow to, uh, grow tobacco in, in these countries and everything else like that. And I don't really, I'm, I'm David Paris from ASP down in Miami. They've, they've been in the tobacco business line. He's one of my best friends in the cigar business. He's a tobacco grower down in Ecuador too. So it's, it's more of a friendly competition. We all tend to do different things and, and I, I don't get wrapped up in that. I let our product stand on its own merits. And Sean, what about your legacy? Well, from, you know, from the day that we started, I would say that people would always come and say, hey, what's your exit strategy? What's your, you know, when are you guys going to sell? You know, you think about the dot-com boom. You think about even the early boom of the cigar industry where these companies would raise money to go public and so forth. Everybody's thought was always that, okay, here's, a, here's another company. All they want to do is get rich quick and then sell off and, and so forth, build it to a certain level. But our goal has been the same since the, from the very beginning, and that's build an enduring company that lasts and so forth. And our purpose, really, why we exist is just to, you know, we recognize that we're behind the scenes. The star are these guys. The, the things that we're protecting is this very thing that we enjoy. And what we're doing is just building that enduring company so that we can continually innovate with technology or product, regardless of what industry, for that matter, um, but really maximizes the enjoyment people get from, from their passions. You know, as far as family, you know, right now we, um, I don't have any family in the business at this point, but the value is um, in the value of the shares of the corporation. Uh, and so we're just building a model in a process in a company that will, that will last. You know, I mean, it, but it's, a, it's really, to me, in the, in the cigar business, it's a great innovation. I mean, that, you know, once you get to the point where you purchase a cigar, it's all about preserving it. And, you know, that, that's not easy. You know, I used to, years ago, take a little sponge and, and wet the sponge and, you know, but then the cigars get wet. So it's... Uh, well, you even look at the... Um, to taste the tobacco, the burn has to be at the right temperature because if it gets too hot, you really lose so much of the character that's in the cigar. Moisture plays such a key role in that, even the burn level and the temperature that you have to get that flavor. And if so, if your cigar is tastes different today and you're not, if you're using some other type of method to preserve it, you know, it tastes different today, it's probably because that moisture on the inside has changed and the burn is different than where, you know, today than it was before. And so you're losing all of that flavor that really you should be enjoying, but you're not because of that moisture content that's in the tobacco. Eric, you spoke about before that, you know, you, you manufacture the cigars and they should sit like a year before they go out. Uh, is there any, time frame that it's you, that it's too long to hold a cigar to smoke it is if it's maintained in the right humidity does it get better with age or whether you smoke it in a year or three or five it should have the same taste it was kept the proper c conditions humidity and temperature it could last for four or five years with not an issue but uh John Oliva does a great service to our industry. For us and other people, they supply us tobacco. We can't make scars without tobacco. And Sean, we still used to do a, a lot of business with them. In the good old days, we sell a lot of cigars to chain stores. Walgreens used to sell a lot of cigars. Eckerd, CVS, we put our Quest Array cigars in the polyethylene bags. We put a, a Humipack in every one of them. Um, well, it was Hewlett Packard. It was, it was back, 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 back in those yeah. days. Those were the good old days where the chain stores actually sell cigars. Now, you, now they don't even sell cigars anymore. Right. So um, you go to a brick and mortar person, a brick and mortar retailer. Chances are they have a good humidor and they have a good humidification. But back in those days, uh, a, a large portion of our business was, was a chain who did not have any humidification system. So it was especially important that we have humidity packs in our cigars. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. That was key business for us. Believe us. Believe me. At that time, when well, we were a young this company, is actually, that endorsement was um, huge. I want to thank you guys very much. This is a great panel because it starts with John, and then it goes to Eric, and it, it ends up with Sean. So everyone's serving a major purpose here. So I want to thank you guys very much. Very informative. And what I want to know is, what are you smoking? Shades of Havana with your host David Zimmel.
And special guests, Eric Newman, John Oliva, and Sean Knutson. Co-producers, John P. Doyle, Steve Zimke, and Karen Guayardo. Producers, David Zimmel and Erwin Sternberg. Executive producers, Sean Sternberg and Michael R. Doyle. Directed by Rod Weber. Created by Michael R. Doyle and Rod Weber. Camera and sound, Josh Reamer, Oscar R. Urdaneta, and Rod Weber. Editors, Steve Zimke, Rod Weber. Special thanks, Charles Rodriguez, Big Boy Media Group, The Detour Duo, Tony and Sarah. Travel content creators, The Detour duo.com senior editor-in-chief of cigar journal reinhold widmeyer co-founder of west tampa tobacco ricky rodriguez and the jc newman cigar company for allowing us to capture history at the jc newman cigar company warehouse in tampa florida shades of havana was brought to you by tampa porsche bovita rabbit air man cave king bliss mortgage fluke apparel company and visit Tampa Bay. Shades of Havana and Cigar Journal, thank you for celebrating and watching our historical J.C. Newman's 128th year anniversary series. Access the best information on the global cigar world. Everything that happens in the premium cigar industry, news, launches, personalities, awards, and above all, our cigar rankings and blind tastings. Scan the QR code where you will receive a free one-year digital subscription to Cigar Journal. Our sponsors' websites and phone numbers are also provided in the show notes. When you visit our sponsors, you're helping them and helping our show. And if you enjoy Shades of Havana, we hope you tell your friends and give us a great rating wherever you get your podcasts. All opinions expressed by the Shades of Havana participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Shades of Havana, Inc., a subsidiary of MRD Productions, LLC. Shades of Havana is an MRD production.